interoperability. And at the time I had been writing about it and said that we had to dismantle the whole system and rebuild it. And Dr. Kareem, uh, Kareem said, that's not practical, but we agreed on one thing and that is that the system had a lot of problems. So we met once and started talking about it and that one meeting led to meeting and after meeting and we were meeting a few times a month. And over that time, we developed a number of interoperability models. I'm gonna speak of one of those today. So what we're gonna talk about today is the problem, the current solution, why that just doesn't work, our proposed solution, why it will work, and the benefits of our solution. So this ugly looking diagram is, a, uh, is of, of the patient and physician experience with regards to scheduling. As you can see, the patient has multiple modes uh, and interfaces to the provider. There's the phone, there's email, there's portals, there's paper mail, and then the providers use fax to communicate. The system is fragmented, obviously. It's confusing and time, uh, time consuming for patients. I'm also a patient, and how many of us know what it's like to be on hold with our doctor's office, only to find out we can't leave a message, and wait days to hear back, and maybe not at all? And management is a burden on busy clinics, too. Things fall through the cracks, like physicians will send a fax for a referral, and they may not hear back. However, our systems aren't designed for good tracking, so things, as I said, things fall through the cracks. Let's take a higher look at the system level with scheduling. We need to maintain directories of practitioners and services. For example, 811, which is a mostly static um, directory. The problem is there's multiple of these. I mean, our office has our own directory, and Ontario Health teams may have their own directory. Everybody's got, they make it all themselves. And they're hard to keep current and appropriately detailed. Let's say I refer a patient to an orthopedic surgeon. Maybe two months later, I get a message that says, sorry, I, I don't do shoulders if I referred for a shoulder surgery, and I've got to re-refer the patient again. It's because I don't know that that particular surgeon doesn't do what I needed. I looked myself up on 811 a couple months ago, and the information about my location is wrong. We all know that access to care is the number one priority for governments and for patients. That's getting family doctors and seeing them when we need it, when we need to. We know it's bad, but we don't have a good handle. We can't measure it. Wait times are measured for some things, like hips and cataracts, but not for everything. So what's the problem with, uh, with uh, solutions like online health booking and um, wait times? They're point solutions, and we need system solutions. So Kareem and I asked ourselves the following question. When running a healthcare system, shouldn't we know what the supply of appointments is? How about the demand for appointments? Shouldn't we know where the demand is highest? Shouldn't we know how long patients are waiting for care across the system? And how many patients don't have a family doctor? And how about how many family doctors are accepting patients? And shouldn't we know all this in real time? And come on, it's, it's uh, 2024 already. So we came up with some requirements for a sustainable solution that we think should be jurisdiction-wide and in real time. What are these? We think everybody in the system, including providers and patients, should be able to book appointments throughout the system. We think they should be able to find those providers and services. We believe that patients should be able to indicate in the system whether they need a primary care provider. We believe providers should be able to uh, indicate whether they're accepting patients. We also believe that providers should be able to share their availability of appointments. And we believe everybody needs a consistent interface, not that messy diagram that I showed you at first. And again, we believe it should be jurisdiction-wide access, uh, the supply access and the demand from users. And of course, it should be in real time. So how can we do this? Well, let's take a look to what everybody looks at is interoperability. If we look at the scheduling modalities that we discussed, phone, fax, emails, portals, and online booking, they're interoperability in that they send information from a sister, a system or user to another system or user in, in a useful fashion. Believe it or not, the phone is an interoperability tool. You know, back in the 1920s or 30s before they had phones, you had to walk to your doctor's office and ask for an appointment. It may be outdated, but that's what it is. It is an operability tool. But we also use other interoperability tools that use the same form of interoperability, e-referrals, HRM, that's hospital um, report manager. That it sends information from hospitals to uh, uh, practitioners. There's Prescribe it that sends pre prescriptions to pharmacies and repositories. 
Now, Kareem and I decided we were going to call this Generation 1 Interoperability. So if we look at a Generation 1 scheduler, how does it meet our requirements that we set up? Well, you can book appointments, but you can't find providers and services. Patients can't indicate their need for primary care. Providers aren't able to indicate that they're accepting patients. Providers can't share their availability for, for appointments. There's no cons consistent interface, and it's not jurisdiction-wide nor real-time. So when we look at generation interoperability, what are the problems? Highly limited functionality. Poor user experience. Vendor innovation leads to local monopolies. You can't generalize these, these innovations. The system, and for that reason and many others, the system doesn't scale up. It just is in disarray and stagnation. So Kareem and I identified another uh, type of interoperability that we're calling generation two interoperability. And it works differently because the silos are, and users have a bi-directional flow of data and the data kind of sits independent and outside of the silos, yet everywhere at all times. Something we're all probably familiar with is mapping services, say Google Maps. How does that work? Well, the users are constantly providing information to the system, and the system's providing information to the users, such as their location, if there's an accident. They can determine how long it's going to take to get somewhere based on other people's data, whether there's traffic. So let's look at the implications of Generation 2 interoperability and uh, if we take this approach. So this would provide system-wide information, information in real time. And we could use it in any data category. We could use it for e-referrals. We could use it for e-prescriptions, um, e-lab ordering. But we're going to take a look now at how this is approached, uh, how we are approaching it to scheduling. And we're calling this the jurisdictional scheduler. So here's a map of how the jurisdictional scheduler work. On the right, you can see that we have some patients. There's three of them. Um, and on the left, you can see that there's providers. And that, the obvious ones are family doctor, physiotherapy, nurse practitioner, but we also, a specialist, but we also have uh, facilities like labs, x-rays, um, uh, emergency rooms, walk-in clinics. It could even be at higher level, like hospitals and other facilities. Now, the patients are using apps. That's what the A stands for. And those apps provide um, a, a single window into and access into the system. And as you can see, the providers also have apps. And this, these apps allows a single sign-in and, um, and a single interface uh, that they're able to use. And the providers are able to, um, to um, put their supply into the system. And you can see the patients request their demand. And it's a unified system. The adjudicator in the middle that you see are all the rules that the system uses, the booking rules. So for instance, if a specialist only takes a ref uh, referral, uh, only takes, lets the patients book an appointment with a referral, that's a rule. All other rules are in there and they're all in common. Now, I wanted to point out uh, a couple things here. Um, one, uh, this is an example. Uh, let's say you're a patient and you want to get immediate care. Let's say you've cut yourself, you've got a laceration. You could look into the system and see all of the available resources and the times available you could see available to you, such as waiting room uh, times in, in uh, the emergency room or walk-in clinics and perhaps even book from a distance in a walk-in clinic and show up just in time rather than sit there for the two or three hours and counting that we have right now. Oh, I haven't raised my points. So yes, patients use their own interface to book appointments with all providers. Providers send their availability to the system. There's supply and demand data available, and the system is integrated. Let's see how this system meets our requirements. You can book appointments. You can find providers and services. Patients can indicate their need for a primary doctor. Uh, patients indicate whether their uh, providers indicate whether they're accepting patients. Providers can share appointments. There's a consistent user interface. I didn't mention this earlier, but the A's in different colors mean that the patients and providers can actually interchangeably switch apps because the apps um, are all uh, working with the same data. So if you don't like an app, switch it to another one. Take that current digital healthcare system. And we have system-wide information. And it's in real time. OK, so right now I'm going to take you on a tour across a whole new world 
of the of this uh, <laughs> of this jurisdictional scheduler. I have a hard time saying that. So let's say a patient comes into the family doctor's office with a rash on her arm. And the family doctor looks at it and goes, I don't know, you got a bad rash. You should see a dermatologist. What the uh, family doctor can do is put a digital token, which is a permission, into the patient's app. And here's the patient, the mock-up of an app that they're looking on their phone. There's many functions on the phone in theory, but I've mentioned them before. But one of the functions would be to book an appointment. They can click on that digital token, and it opens up something that could look like this, a dermatologist near me. And the patients could uh, sort in any number of ways, the availability, the hours, the distance, the wait time, uh, the gender, the language. They could click on any number of, of, of uh, profiles and look at the physician, decide whether they want to book there, click a button and book it. Now, I mentioned before that physicians have to keep their own directories and they're never up to date. A physician could use a tool like this to build a directory and keep it up to date uh, very easily. Now, we're, we just took a look at the ground level of how to use the system, but what if we took a step up to, let's say, an OHT level? How could you OHTs use this? Well, they could app that have an app that looks something like this. And this app has like, I think it has 30 clinics on it. And the orange is, is the uh, wait time to be seen at that clinic, and the blue is whether or not they're taking new patients. Could be a valuable tool for them. Or we could go all the way up to the top level, the jurisdictional scheduler dashboard, and let's say a system planner would look at this, they can see the total, total uh, jurisdictional supply, demand, appointment supply, demand mismatch, whether or not who's accepting patients, what about unattached patients, wait times, and they could dice and slice this in any way, like region, um, emergency room, long-term care, disease-based, really any way. Uh, actually, I haven't explained how we would do it disease-based. That's a future uh, potential function in a system like this. So in 2023, the Ministry of Health had the digital strategy refresh, and they had a number of things that they wanted to accomplish. And I'm gonna show you how what we are, are demonstrating here meets those criteria. One, they want a digital front door. Well, you can't get much more wide open than this digital front door. They want to connect all digital and data users. It speaks for itself. They want to build on 811. Well, 811 is a static tool. We want to, it's going to be a live ecosystem with what, we, uh, what we're talking about here. There's, they want seamless integrated care. Well, care starts with appointments, and here you go. And finally, they want simple digital tools for frontline providers that are not a burden. I forgot to mention, but the physicians can use the system right in their own EMRs because the app could be built right in uh, to their EMR and they could access it from there. Okay, so we all know that there's efficiency deficit in healthcare and it's getting worse and worse. It, it can be measured, the cost can be measured in terms of time, money, delayed care, and health complications. Health professionals are burning out and they're quitting. And government is already paying for this indirectly no matter how, no matter the fact that you can't measure it. So government has a role in re to regulate and incentivize the right things. What are these? Well, we think they should uh, regulate a central, uh, the creating of a central repository of appointments and requests for appointments with API access. This will enable a real-time view of access to care and demand for care it will enable the market to respond to market needs while ensuring standardization of appointments. We also think, oh, I didn't put that up, create a central repository. They also should be creating a user account system for patients, providers, facilities, organizations with API access. The user account system, once set up, should be managed by the users themselves. Let the physicians, let the providers, you know, uh, regulate, uh, control this or act, uh, Edit this like you do a Facebook profile. Um, and this can be used by other applications too, like in e-referral, e-labs, um, and prescribing. And finally, we think they should incentivize the building of apps uh, that, that let vendors allow viewing and working with data with all the users, because the data is standardized. It's easy to switch apps without migration. Without migration, it's a, we don't hear that at all in the, these days. And innovation occurs by competition, not monopolies. Thank you very much.